Book 7, Chapter 7 Robespierre was reclining languidly in his fauteuil, his cadaverous countenance more jaded and fatigued than usual. He to whom Catherine Theo assured immortal life looked indeed like a man at death's door. On the table before him was a dish heaped with oranges, with the juice of which it is said that he could alone assuage the acrid bile that overflowed his system. And an old woman, richly dressed, she had been a marquise in the old regime, was employed in peeling the Hesperian fruits for the sick dragon, with delicate fingers covered with jewels. I had before said that Robespierre was the idol of the women, Strange, certainly, but then they were French women. The old Marquise, who, like Catherine Theo, called him son, really seemed to love him piously and disinterestedly as a mother, and as she peeled the oranges and heaped on him the most caressing and soothing expressions, the livid ghost of a smile fluttered about his meager lips. At a distance, Peon and Caton seated at another table, were writing rapidly, and occasionally pausing from their work to consult with each other in brief whispers. Suddenly, one of the Jacobins opened the door, and, approaching Robespierre, whispered to him the name of Guerin. At that word, the sick man started up, as if new life were in the sound. My kind friend, he said to the Marquise, forgive me, I must dispense with thy tender cares. France demands me. I am never ill when I can serve my country. The old Marquise lifted up her eyes to heaven and murmured, Calange. Robespierre waved his hand impatiently, and the old woman, with a sigh, patted his pale cheek, kissed his forehead, and submissively withdrew. The next moment, the smiling, sober man we have before described stood bending low before the tyrant, and well might Robespierre welcome one of the subtlest agents of his power, one on whom he relied more than the clubs of his Jacobins, the tongues of his orators, the bayonets of his armies. Guerin, the most renowned of his écouteurs, the searching, prying, universal, omnipresent spy, who glided like a sunbeam through chink and crevice, and brought to him intelligence not only of deeds, but the hearts of men. Well, citizen, well, and what of Talion? This morning, early, two minutes after eight, he went out. So early, hmm. He passed Rue de Quatre Filles, Rue de Temple, Rue de la Réunion, Amoray, Rue Marton. Nothing observable, except that. That what? He amused himself at a stall in bargaining for some books. Bargaining for books? Ha <laughs> ha, the charlatan. He would cloak the intriguant under the savant. Well. At last, at the Rue des Fossés Montmartre, an individual in a blue surtout, unknown, accosted him. They walked together about the street some minutes, and were joined by Legendre. Legendre! Approach, Peon, Legendre, thou hearest. I went into a fruit stall and hired two little girls to go and play at ball within hearing. They heard Legendre say, I believe his power is wearing itself out. And Talion answered, and himself too, I would not give three months' purchase for his life. I do not know, citizen, if they meant thee. Nor I, citizen, answered Robespierre with a fell smile succeeded by an expression of gloomy thought. Ha, he muttered, I am young yet, in the prime of my life. I commit no excess. No, my constitution is sound, sound. Anything farther of Talion? Yes, the woman whom he loves, Teresa de Fontenay, who lies in prison, still continues to correspond with him, to urge him to save her by thy destruction. This my listeners overheard. His servant is the messenger between the prisoner and himself. So, the servant shall be seized in the open streets of Paris. The reign of terror is not over yet. With the letters found on him, if such their context, 
I will pluck Talion from his benches in the convention. Rose Pierre rose, and, after walking a few moments to and fro the room in thought, opened the door and summoned one of the Jacobins without. To him he gave his orders for the watch and arrest of Talion's servant, and then threw himself again into his chair. As the Jacobin departed, Garon whispered, Is that not the citizen Aristide? Yes, a faithful fellow, if he would wash himself and not swear so much. Didst thou not guillotine his brother? But Aristide denounced him. Nevertheless, are such men safe about thy person? Humph, that is true. And Robespierre, drawing out his pocket-book, wrote a memorandum in it, replaced it in his vest, and resumed. What else of Talion? Nothing more. He and Legendre, with the unknown, walked to the Chardon Egalité, and there parted. I saw Talion to his house, but I have other news. Thou badest me watch for those who threaten thee in secret letters. Geron, hast thou detected them? Hast thou? Hast thou? And the tyrant, as he spoke, opened and shut both his hands, as if already grasping the lives of the writers, and one of those convulsive grimaces that seemed like an epileptic affection to which he was subject, distorted his features. Citizen. I think I have found one. Thou must know that amongst those most disaffected is the painter Nico. Stay, stay, said Robespierre, opening a manuscript book, bound in red Morocco, for Robespierre was neat and precise, even in his death lists, and turning to an alphabetical index, Nico. I have him, atheist, sans culotte, I hate Slavins, friend of Hibert. Aha! Nota bene, René Dumas knows of his early career and crimes. Proceed. This Nico has been suspected of diffusing tracts and pamphlets against thyself and the committee. Yesterday evening, when he was out, his porter admitted me into his apartment, Rue Beaurepaire. With my master key, I opened his desk and escritoire. I found herein a drawing of thyself at the guillotine, and underneath was written, Barreau de Tompe, Lilaret de Tonchatin. I compared the words with the fragments of the various letters thou gavest me. The handwriting tallies with one. See, I tore off the writing. Robespierre looked, smiled, and, as if his vengeance were already satisfied, threw himself on his chair. It is well. I feared it was a more powerful enemy. This man must be arrested at once. And he waits below. I brushed by him as I ascended the stairs. Does he so? Admit. Nay, hold, hold. Get on. Withdraw into the inner chamber till I summon thee again. Dear Payon, see that this Nico conceals no weapons. Payon, who was as brave as Robespierre was pusillanimous, repressed a smile of disdain that quivered on his lips a moment, and left the room. Meanwhile, Robespierre, with his head buried in his bosom, seemed plunged in deep thought. Life is a melancholy thing, Couton, said he suddenly. Begging your pardon, I think death worse, answered the philanthropist gently. Robespierre made no rejoinder, but took from his portefeuille that singular letter, which was found afterwards amongst his papers, and is marked sixty-one, in the published collection. Without doubt, it began, you are uneasy at not having earlier received news from me. Be not alarmed. You know that I ought only to reply by our ordinary courier, and as he has been interrupted, Don Sadernia course, that is the cause of my delay. When you receive this, employ all diligence to fly a theater where you are about to appear and disappear for the last time. It were idle to recall to you all the reasons that expose you to peril. The last step that should place you sur le sofa de la présidence, but brings you to the scaffold, and the mob will spit on your face as it has spat on those whom you have judged. Since then, you have accumulated here a sufficient treasure for existence. I await you with great impatience, 
to laugh with you at the part you have played in the troubles of a nation as credulous as it is avid of novelties. Take your part according to our arrangements. All is prepared. I conclude. Our courier waits. I expect your reply. Musingly and slowly, the dictator devoured the contents of this epistle. No, he said to himself, no. He who has tasted power can no longer enjoy repose. Yet Danton, Danton, thou art right. Better to be a poor fisherman than to govern men. The door opened, and Payan reappeared and whispered to Robespierre, All is safe. See the man. The dictator, satisfied, summoned his attendant Jacobin to conduct Nicot to his presence. The painter entered with a fearless expression in his deformed features, and stood erect before Robespierre, who scanned him with a sidelong eye. It is remarkable that most of the principal actors of the revolution were singularly hideous in appearance. From the colossal ugliness of Mirabeau and Danton, or the villainous ferocity in the countenances of David and Simon, to the filthy squalor of Marat, the sinister and bilious meanness of the dictator's features. But Robespierre, who is said to resemble a cat, had also a cat's cleanness, and his prim and dainty dress, his shaven smoothness, the womanly whiteness of his lean hands, made yet more remarkable the disorderly roofianism that characterized the attire and mane of the painter Sans-Culotte. And so, citizen, said Robespierre mildly, thou wouldst speak with me. I know thy merits and civism have been overlooked too long. Thou wouldst ask some suitable provision in the state. Scruple not, say on. Virtuous Robespierre, toi qui éclaire l'univers, I come not to ask a favor, but to render service to the state. I have discovered a correspondence that lays open a conspiracy of which many of the actors are yet unsuspected. And he placed the papers on the table. Robespierre seized and ran his eye over them rapidly and eagerly. Good, good, he muttered to himself. This is all I wanted. Barère, Legendre, I have them. Camille de Moulin was but their dupe. I loved him once. I never loved them. Citizen Nicot, I thank thee. I observe these letters are addressed to an Englishman. What Frenchman but must distrust these English wolves in sheep's clothing? France wants no longer citizens of the world. That farce ended with Anacarsis Clutes. I beg pardon, Citizen Nicot, but Clutes and Hebert were thy friends. Nay, said Nico, apologetically, we are all liable to be deceived. I ceased to honor them whom thou didst declare against, for I disown my own senses rather than thy justice. Yes, I pretend to justice. That is the virtue I affect, said Robespierre meekly, and with his feline propensities he enjoyed, even in that critical hour of vast schemes, of imminent danger, of meditated revenge, the pleasure of playing with a solitary victim. And my justice shall no longer be blind to thy services, good Nico. Thou knowest this Glyndon. Yes, well, intimately, he was my friend, but I would give up my brother if he were one of the indulgence. I am not ashamed to say that I have received favors from this man. Aha, and thou dost honestly hold the doctrine that where a man threatens my life, all personal favors are to be forgotten. Ah, good citizen, kind Nico, oblige me by writing the address of this Glyndon. Nico stooped to the table, and suddenly, when the pen was in his hand, a thought flashed across him, and he paused, embarrassed and confused. Right on, kind Nico. The painter slowly obeyed. Who are the other familiars of Glyndon? It was on that point I was about to speak to the representant, said Nico. He visits daily a woman, a foreigner, who knows all his secrets. She affects to be poor and to support her child by industry, but she is the wife of an Italian of immense wealth, 
and there is no doubt that she has monies which are spent in corrupting the citizens. She should be seized and arrested. Write down her name also. But no time is to be lost, for I know that both have a design to escape from Paris this very night. Our government is prompt, good Nico, never fear. Humph, humph. And Robespierre took the paper on which Nico had written, and, stooping over it, for he was near-sighted, added smilingly, Dost thou always write the same hand, citizen? This seems almost like a disguised character. I should not like them to know who denounced them, Representant. Good, good. Thy virtue shall be rewarded. Trust me. Salut et fraternité. Robespierre half rose as he spoke, and Nico withdrew. Ho there! Without! cried the dictator, ringing his bell, and as the ready Jacobin attended the summons, follow that man, Jean Nico. The instant he has cleared the house, seize him. At once with the conciergerie with him. Stay. Nothing against the law. There is thy warrant. The public accuser shall have my instruction. Away, quick. The Jacobin vanished. All trace of illness, of infirmity, had gone from the valetudinarian. He stood erect on the floor, his face twitching convulsively, and his arms folded. Ho, oh, Garon! The spy reappeared. Take these addresses. Within an hour, this Englishman and his woman must be in prison. Their revelations will aid me against worthier foes. They shall die. They shall perish with the rest on the tenth, the third day from this. There, he wrote hastily, there also is thy warrant. Off! And now, Couton, Payon, we will dally no longer with Talion and his crew. I have information that the convention will not attend the fete on the tenth. We must trust only to the sword of the law. I must compose my thoughts, prepare my harangue. Tomorrow I will reappear at the convention. Tomorrow, bold Saint Just joins us, fresh from our victorious armies. Tomorrow, from the tribune, I will dart the thunderbolt on the masked enemies of France. Tomorrow I will demand, in the face of the country, the heads of the conspirators.